Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for this uh, for this webinar this morning. My name is Mark Fielden. I'm a real estate and construction tax partner here at Moore Kingston Smith. Um, for the observant among you, you'll see that uh, my background is actually that of a, a, of a, a rather frosty and snowy beach. I'm not actually on the beach, um, but I, uh, I had to change from my uh, my kitten uh, kitten uh, background earlier this morning. Um, so that's enough of the jokes. Um, I'm I'm quite used to doing these seminars more in person than 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 online. So I'm used to use usually talking about fire drills and emergency exits and whatnot, but I guess we don't care about any of that at the moment. Um, so without further ado, we'll, we'll, we'll get to the matter at hand. So we're gonna do um, a, probably a quick 45, 45 minutes, one hour this morning on the VAT reverse charge in the construction industry. Now, this is a, a topic that's been bubbling around um, for, for a number of years now. Um, we first had talk of this back in October 2018, um, and then we had a proposed introduction in 2019, which was pushed back, pushed back to October 20, which is again pushed back because obviously everyone was in the middle of uh, the coronavirus pandemic, as we still are. Um, but we now have a an implementation date um, approaching very quickly, some 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 two weeks away. Um, so. We wanted to take this opportunity to talk to talk to our clients, to talk to our contacts, um, really to provide a bit of education as to as to as to what uh, what what this will mean for the industry, um, to ask some questions, to ask you guys some questions, and and to have a a bit of a discussion around what is quite an important matter, um, albeit relatively niche, um, for for the construction construction industry. Now. Mm -hmm. You're lucky enough this morning that you're going to stop hearing from me very shortly, um, and we have a very um, a very expert panel joining us this morning. Um, my colleagues joining us this morning are Debbie Jennings, um, a VAT expert from our from our VAT team, um, Guy Richardson, um, an audit partner specialising and focusing on construction businesses, and we're also very lucky to be joined this morning by David Savage from Charles Russell Speechley who is a partner there in their construction team, um, who will be able to give us a slightly more nuanced and enhanced view um, in terms of how this is going to impact the industry, rather than just focus on the tax accounting and, and cash flow matters that, that we're going to talk about. So I'm not going to say much more. I'll be coming back occasionally through this, uh, through this webinar to ask poll questions, which you will have the ability to answer on your uh, on your phones or your laptops, um, and we'll, we'll we'll do some flash results of those, um, and I may be asking some questions of our panel later on. But I, with that, I will pass over to Debbie, who's going to do a bit more of a, a detail just to bring people up to speed as to as to what the VAT reverse charge in the construction industry um, looks like. So, Debbie, over to you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Welcome everybody on this cold uh, day. Um, and we are working towards the 1st of March. So what, 17 days now to launch. As Mark said, this has been postponed twice, but as things stand today during this presentation, we are work working towards the 1st of March when we, you have to, the word must is used in HMRC's guidance. You must use these new rules. So how do they apply? Well, it is reverse charge. It's HMRC's one of HMRC's favourite mechanisms to tighten up controls. And so what you're looking at, are uh, if you are effectively a subcontractor or uh, similar and you are supplying services that fall within CIS arrangements, your customer is VAT registered and your supplies are subject to VAT at the standard rate or the zero, uh, sorry, or the reduced rate, i.e. not the zero rate, so nothing in the line of, say, constructing new houses and you're not an employment business and your customer has given you has not given you written confirmation that they're an end user i.e the final business in the supply chain then you have to use the reverse charge so what does that mean that means you do not charge vat on the invoice that you are raising to your customer 
and your customer effectively self accounts. So the VAT comes out of the supply chain. As I said, it doesn't apply to zero rated supplies because by the very nature, there is no positive rate of tax to account for. So the customer then has to apply the reverse charge within the day of VAT records. So essentially the customer is taking in on your liability, your uh, requirement to account for that to HMRC. So what this means in practical terms, you will not get paid the VAT by your customer. Your invoice will be net and it will stay net. Um, your customer may be an end user. And what that means is they are effectively the final, the final business in the supply chain. They need, if you are an end user, so if you're effectively the developer, uh, 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 somebody connected to the developer, if you're a landlord tenant type arrangement, what you do, you have to give a written confirmation of that status to the supplier behind you. And that's the end user written confirmation. Um, and obviously when you're asking the questions, if you were the supplier, you need the VAT number of your customer. You need to know that they're in the construction industry scheme. You need to do these checks. So as we know, VAT operates as a self-assessment regime. So the onus falls on the taxpayer. This is not optional either. This is not a case of, well, I'm not quite sure. I'll charge VAT just to be on the safe side. It is a mandatory requirement. HMRC has said they're gonna take uh, a light touch for the first six months. So they've given you time to bed this in, but that's not an opportunity to ignore it and hope it goes away. These light touch periods, as we saw with MTD, the making tax digital uh, changes, was that they, they allow you a little bit of leeway during the six months or the first six months of the new regime to, to get used to it. So they want, they said they want to apply penalties to take a sort of more practical approach, pragmatic approach, but you're going to have to get this to, to fit into your accounting system so that your system, if you are the supplier of these services and you are <clears throat> effectively the subcontractor that is not going to get paid VAT. And if you're the customer that's going to have to do the reverse charge, then your VAT accounting needs to embrace these changes and uh, be able to accommodate them. Also, you need to, uh, again, the, the, the checks are effectively onto the taxpayer. So HMRC is saying that you have to do the legwork to check the status of the supply chain and where you fit within it. Also, if you've got a mixture of uh, services, so some that may fall within this and some that are outside it, then you're effectively, the default position is you treat all of it as the uh, reverse charge. It is the preferred way of operating. So HMRC are effectively saying, well, that's your default mechanism, go with it. So as I say, you need to, if you're in the middle of the supply chain, you need to look at your customers. Are they end users? Are they giving you an end user certificate? Or looking behind you at your, the supplier supplying to you, are you required to do the reverse charge? How does that work? And what are those supplies, et cetera? So there's actually quite a bit to do when we're looking at 17 days out now. Um, and uh, myself, my colleagues, and obviously yourselves as well, are going to look at this and how it can apply and essentially the wider, the wider issues that you need to um, consider. OK, back to you, Mark. Somebody's shouting at the screen, you're on mute. <laughs> 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 well, I would say I did that on purpose, but I didn't. Um, I, I should have said that I should have said at the start of this uh, start of the webinar that we're not doing slides, um, as you may have seen. Um, but what we will be doing is 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 a is an, a mail out to people who who've who've endured and sat through this uh, through this session with us this morning, with a bit more detail and background, um, and some 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 takeaways from the from the session this morning. Um, so what we're going to do now is after Debbie sort of now she's given us that that pricey of, of, of the arrangements. We're going to ask a few questions to our panel um, and we're also going to do some poll questions to you guys uh, listening at home or in the office. Um, so I think the, the first I've, I've got a few, uh, as you might imagine, a few panel questions already up my sleeve and a few are coming in on the chat function. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask us, there is a chat function within this webinar. Um, Please use it, and we will uh, we'll either answer them live if we can, or or we'll take them offline and and come back to you um, with answers that way. 
Um, so, Deb, in terms of uh, sort of useful useful overview, in terms of what uh, in terms of what HMRC are looking to achieve from revert, introducing a reverse charge mechanism for VAT into the construction industry, what is it? What are they looking to do here? Why are they doing this? Yeah, the uh, this is the as I said in uh, that little pricey there, it's their favourite way of tightening what they regard as um, as risk. So they take VAT out of the supply chain. Um, and much as CIS addresses direct tax issues, this new re reverse charge is to take the, the risk away of somebody charging VAT and therefore and not paying it over to HMRC. So essentially it's an anti-avoidance mechanism because the customer is accounting for the VAT on behalf of the supplier. Um, the estimate that we've bandied around the figure, excuse me, is 100 million per annum. This is what the, uh, the UK Exchequer has said is they are losing in real VAT down to these uh, uh, perceived frauds um, in the supply chain where the supplier charges an account of that and then disappears. So missing trade of fraud. And we see this uh, this type of domestic reverse charge in relation to computer chips, mobile phones and some other areas, telecoms, where HMRC have done this in the past. And they think it's a uh, it's a good way of tightening up controls. Um, there are some questions coming through on on the chat. Um, one of them being, if your, your point, Deb, around um, the, the the end user having to be identified yeah. uh, in the supply chain. What if there isn't? Um, what if there isn't one? What if there isn't an end user identified? Um, what happens then? It's, it's got to be an end user. At the end, if we put a maybe like little scenario around it, so. If I'm a developer and I'm going to uh, build houses and flats and uh, new offices, so I'm getting a combination of uh, zero rate and standard rate services, I am the end user because I'm the final person in the supply chain. I'm not going to supply those construction services on. I'm going to either rent out or sell the developed properties. So I will be given an end user certificate each time I uh, contract with somebody because by the nature of what I do, I am the end user. I'm using the construction services to develop buildings. And just, just one very quick one. Is there a standard format for that in end user certificate? What somebody has asked across the chat function? There isn't an, a sort of a HMRC standard, but there is a standard form of words. And in our um, in the uh, the follow up document and, and handout that we've uh, put together, that's that's covered in there. So it's about three lines that you would put on the um, notification to your supply chain as to your end user status. Okay, and ju just one more before I move on yeah, to the next. Sure. Um, we've we, we we we've had a question from 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 somebody around subcontractors. We're making the observation that the subcontractors will also quite often work direct for end clients. Presumably if they do, then it's a normal case of charging charging that end client VAT as appropriate. Um, again, it'll come down to the state as the end client. So if it's a uh, uh, so if it's an end user, they'll get the end user certificate from the client and then the normal rules apply. And if it was a, um, if it was a private individual like ourselves, we're not that registered. So again, normal VAT rules would apply because we couldn't normal do the reverse rules. charge. Yeah. Fine, okay, understood. Understood. So I think we're going to do a poll question now for the audience. Okay. Um, and <laughs> forgive me, uh, forgive me, I don't see that on my screen. So I'm going to read it to you off my screen. And I, I'm hoping and praying that you have some boxes to tick to give some answers. Um, so the first poll question, very simple. Um, we're, we're just looking for an understanding from, from the audience to this webinar as to how prepared you are as a business or, or indeed a market participant, how prepared you are for the um, for the introduction of the rules in a couple of weeks time. Now, there's five answers. One basically saying, um, not very well prepared and all, all ready to go, ranging down to five where you're essentially completely unprepared and this is the first you've heard of it, um, which is if the case and you're on this webinar, you've probably got a bit to do. Um, I'm not gonna read out all the answers. So I'm sure everyone can uh, can tap in what they need to. Um, but uh, I, think, I think we have a poll in progress I'm seeing on my screen. so. We should have the answer shortly, um, but whilst that comes through, um, I think I'll probably move to to the next 
next question for our for our panel and I can see lots coming in on the chat function so we'll do those in a moment um so question for Guy Guy Richardson good morning time to speak mate welcome <laughs> um, um so this this th these rules apply through the supply chain don't they um what what happens if somebody gets what happens if you get it wrong Right. Well, first of all, um, thanks very much, everyone, for joining us on the uh, on the webinar. Um, I'm going to start just firstly by ask, answering a couple of questions at the start that I think we, we missed that are probably quite pertinent, actually. One is one is about um, if we've started a project um, where there was no injuries at IE before the rules um, came into force, or indeed we started a project where we were working with somebody that was not an end user, and then an end user comes into play as our customer. Um, the simple answer is you from the point at which you um, you start to interact with an end user, you need to change the way that you are operating. And between the two contracting parties, you need to agree the specific date at which that applies. So if, for example, you're doing monthly invoicing and it occurs within that particular month, then you would probably agree either to start applying or disapplying the rules as appropriate from either the end or the beginning or some of the date as was appropriate to your chain. So it's essentially Essentially, when something changes, change, change the operation of the rules. And the second one was, if we've got an outstanding invoice raised prior to the 1st of March, and it's paid after the 1st of March, do you still get paid the VAT? And the answer is yes. If it's raised before the 1st of March and it's correctly raised with VAT, then that's fine. When it gets paid is, is largely irrelevant and it's still owed um, in the normal way. It's about what you do on the invoice in the first instance. So I just thought I'd cover those quickly off before I move on to my question. And in terms of my question, you know, where can things go wrong um, and, and what happens if they go wrong? Firstly, if things are going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong because basically people in the supply chain have not communicated and not agreed up front what is going to happen and how they're going to apply these rules. So the subcontractors haven't discussed with the, um, the main contractors where they fit in, which is almost certainly in that arrangement, going to be the DRC needs to be applied. And the end user hasn't been properly established to, to figure out where the person providing construction services needs to charge VAT. So uh, like most things, prevention is better than cure. Uh, and the first thing you should always be doing is talking within your supply chain and finding out where you fit in that supply chain, where your suppliers fit in that supply chain and where your customer fits in that supply chain so that you can establish and agree upfront where things are going to be. And that is especially important for any projects that are ongoing at the moment and are going to be ongoing on the 1st of March for the reasons I just spoke about, because you are going to need to establish a transition date and make sure that from that date you apply things correctly. Now, where I can see things going wrong um, primarily um, is in a couple of scenarios. Firstly, you have a subcontractor, you're a main contractor. It's very clear that the DRC does apply because they're providing construction services to you and you are not an end user. But for whatever reason, lack of education or just trying to be prudent, they charge VAT anyway, instead of um, applying the DRC. Um, in that circumstance, they've es essentially raised an incorrect invoice and they've charged VAT where they should not be charged in VAT. Um, and your first port of call is to not accept the invoice and go back to them and say, actually, you've got this wrong and um, you, need to, you need to correct this. Um, certainly, we wouldn't advocate paying the full invoice because the VAT that you've charged, you may not be able to get back from them. And in theory, HMRC could deny you the input tax recovery um, on that VAT because it was um, incorrectly charged. So um, communication is the key, going back to them. By all means, pay the, um, the net amount because that is the correct amount. Uh, and perhaps in your system, you record that as a payment on account rather than an invoice, such that you're not incorrectly reporting on your VAT return. Similarly, if you happen to be an end user because um, you own a property um, or you are what's known as an intermediary supplier, which means that you're, you are providing onward construction services, but you're providing it to a connected party. So the, the revenue look at that as a whole and say, well, actually, you're effectively an end user. Um, and somebody does not apply the DRC, does apply the DRC when actually they should be charging you VAT. 
broadly speaking, it's the same answer. You need to tell them that actually they've got their invoicing wrong. And if somebody hasn't charged you VAT, well, then you certainly can't account for it and you certainly can't um, uh, can't pay it to them and uh, and shouldn't pay it to the revenue. So, again, the best thing to um, to do is to just go back to them, by all means, pay the invoice again and be ready and willing to pay the VAT if they do actually uh, later date get their invoicing right and, um, and, and put it in there. Some might be tempted to just say, well, actually, that's their fault for getting it wrong. And I'm just going to not say anything and um, and hope that it uh, goes away. But we probably wouldn't advocate that because ultimately that's potentially building up a bigger problem down the line where you suddenly have a big VAT bill come through that's legitimately raised, just legitimately raised after the event. Um, so communication is definitely um, the key there. Um, and there was a question just to touch on as well. The other area where this could get wrong is where an end user doesn't issue a certificate. Um, and therefore, you kind of know that they're an end user, but they haven't done the process that, to, to confirm that to you. And there was some guidance earlier on um, back in 2020 or maybe even 2019 that suggested that um, the revenue expected people to, broadly speaking, use common sense and to apply the rules where, it's, um, where they think it should apply. However, that part of the guidance seems to have dropped off somewhere. So on reading the guidance at the moment, it seems to be that if an end user does not issue a certificate, then you assume that they're not an end user, which is probably not the best position to be in. Um, and hence why upfront communication and establishing those positions is absolutely paramount to evolve, uh, avoiding problems down the line. Now, some of you may be interested to know, well, how do I actually do reverse charge on my VAT return? I don't know. Um, well, we've got um, a little takeaway that we'll send down at the end, which does actually give some guidance on that. So I won't answer that in, um, in here, but there will be some guidance so that you can, you can see that and make sure that you can apply it correctly. And we also did have a question prior to this about self-billing and how do we deal with this in self-billing if we're preparing the invoices you know, for our subcontractors? And actually, I think that makes things really, really easy at the end of the day. You've got control over those invoices. You can make, you can make sure that they're right. So if you're in a self-billing um, position, that's probably a good place to be right now because you've got control over the systems. A couple of final points. Um, obviously, I've talked about communication between the suppliers and the uh, and the customers about um, making sure that everything's clear and upfront. That isn't necessarily done by the people who are actually going to have to process the invoices, pay the invoices, and prepare the VAT return. So it is important to make sure that your teams, which could be an outsourced team dealing with your VAT return or your bookkeeping, are fully in the loop about who are, who's in this chain and what the rules um, rules mean. Um, so that when you're passing them the information and the invoices, one, they can process them correctly, and two, they've got the chance to spot that something's not right. Um, otherwise, you could have been in a position where, from your point of view, you're doing everything correctly, but actually when you filter down into the groundwork of the invoices flowing through, something's wrong and you're building up a large problem over the course of time. Uh, and lastly, just as a, as a final comment, as Debbie said, there is a soft landing on this um, of approximately six months, I think is the time frame, um, which means that it's, um, it's not necessarily the end of the world if something goes wrong and almost certainly something will go wrong somewhere along the line for, for many um, clients and many um, businesses. Um, but that soft landing is something to be treated as a testing ground to get this right in the long run, because at the point it turns from a soft landing into a hard landing and um, six months down the line, you want to be on the right side of this and being fully compliant. Otherwise, um, given that the revenue need to raise some taxes at the moment, um, they might be quite aggressive in going after businesses going getting it wrong. Back to you, Mark. Thanks, Guy. Um... I'm glad I've got my fake background on because if, 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 if I didn't have that, you'd be able to see um, my dad walking past throwing snowballs at the window, which is a, um, slightly distracting when you're on a webinar, I can assure you. Um, I, will be, uh, I will be speaking to him by another webinar later on to explain my views on that. Um, should we do another poll question? I'm looking at Fab. She's going to give me the thumbs up. I suspect you can't see her, but I can. We'll do another poll question. Um, on the basis that people do are aware of the uh, are aware of the uh, reverse charge, and you wouldn't be here if you weren't. Um, what's your view on how easy or difficult it's going to be to to bring it into your businesses? 
and to, to account for it and to do it and to follow the rules as they're going to apply um, from the start of next month. Again, you've got four possible answers this time. Um, they're on your screen now, so uh, let's, uh, let's see them. And um, whilst, whilst people are furiously clicking away, um, why don't we do another question? And I think we can probably bring our guest speaker to more Kingston Smith in at this point, uh, David Savage from Charles Russell Speechley. As I say again, pleasure, pleasure to have you here, David, and thank you for joining us. Um, the panel question for you, um, how big an impact on cash flow do you think these new rules are going to be? And I think that's probably the critical one that a lot of or most businesses are thinking about here. Yes, I think I think that's right, Mark. Um, and you know, let's just acknowledge the 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 overall context that that we start with here, which is that in the construction industry, um, not that anybody necessarily celebrates this fact, um, but it's a high turnover, relatively low margin sort of business that we're all in, and um, holding on to other people's money is actually you know one of the um, uh, one of the advantages uh, that parts of the supply chain enjoy um, and and it's against that background that you know we need to look at the winners and the losers uh, resulting from this significant uh, VAT change and in short you know lead contractors are going to be funding less VAT and therefore are going to be experiencing a cash flow gain and essentially subcontractors are going to um, collect less VAT and are therefore going to have a cash flow deficit. So as ever, it's um, essentially the SMEs who are likely to be in a worse position here. And that's before you get into all of the issues around um, SMEs being able to take proper advice, um, invest in the necessary upgrades to their invoicing software and systems and procedures and processes, and training and everything else that goes with this. So I think, you know, looking at how this has played out over the last uh, weeks and months as we've gotten closer to the 1st of March, I think there are two central questions. One is, is this a fair change to be making uh, uh, by government on the taxation of our sector? That's the first question, is it fair um, a priori? And then secondly, it's obviously the timing question. And you've already uh, alluded to the fact that this has been kicked back once by 12 months. Um, but of course, um, the world uh, 12 months on is obviously a very different uh, place to where we were uh, a year ago. And I'd like to make a few comments about that and position that in the context of other challenges that the construction sector is having to deal with at the moment, regulatory and compliance challenges, as well as just the general trading environment and the consequences of the COVID crisis. Um, I mean, ultimately, it should come as no surprise that revenue and government does everything it can to protect its tax base and improve its tax base and improve uh, compliance and resist fraud. I mean, that, 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 that would be naive uh, to, to think otherwise. Um, having said that, if the revenue zone assessment that this may be hemorrhaging let's say 100 million per annum, even that has got to be seen in the context of a sector which is worth 117 billion pounds per annum to the economy. So not necessarily my view, but some might say this is relatively small fry. Uh, but I suspect that this is the political direction of travel, the economic direction of travel, given all the other funding challenges uh, HMRC are going to be facing. So I think most people would come to a view, perhaps reluctantly, that these changes are, um, are, 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 are not a bad thing uh, objectively, but the industry is certainly taking the view that the timing of this is deeply unhelpful. And part of that is COVID related, but part of it is because we have in the sector other significant regulatory and compliance change coming in at the, the beginning of the new tax year on April the 6th. So, for example, uh, we've got significant changes to the construction industry scheme, and we've got uh, uh, changes to the off-payroll uh, um, IR35 regime that we saw come in for the public sector uh, last year and is now being introduced 
uh, in the private sector. Uh, and those are regulatory and compliance challenges in and of themselves. But when you put them alongside what's happening or proposed to be happening here, there's actually quite a complicated interplay between VAT reverse charge, construction industry scheme changes, and the proposed IR35 changes. So as if it wasn't enough for SME, uh, uh, SMO um, subcontractors to be getting their head around that reverse charge, they're having to do that at the same time as getting their head around changes to CIS, changes to IR35, and critically, the interplay between each of those three sets of changes. So, you know, we haven't got time uh, this morning, and I'm very conscious that I'm sitting here with a bunch of accountants who will know this uh, technical accounting stuff much better than I do, but, but just as an observer, um, let me just point to a few uh, of, of those interfaces. So, um, I mean, first of all, um, I think um, the IR35 changes are going to take precedence over the CIS changes if there's a conflict between the two. Uh, so that would be one interesting interface. And then a second interesting interface is, of course, the fact that CIS applies to services, not materials, but that reverse charge applies to both services uh, and materials. So, for example, if you um, buy a substantial amount of materials for use uh, in your work, uh, all or almost all of your services may fall under the reverse charge, and you may find that you're actually in a repayment position uh, with HMRC. Um, your VAT return is a repayment from, from HMRC rather than a payment. Um, so I think there are many practical things that companies um, who haven't already engaged in the space need to be thinking about right now, practical things they need to be thinking about. Mm -hmm. One of the most important one, of course, is um, changes to software systems, um, which, which generate the invoicing and so forth. If you use a standard product like Sage, I'm told that you know, their, their systems uh, have been centrally updated. If you use more bespoke software, it's something that's going to need uh, to be engaged with pretty quickly. I think um, there's an interesting um, argument depending on where you flirt, where you fall on these cash flow uh, differences, whether you might want to request uh, monthly VAT uh, returns rather than quarterly. I'd be interested in other panelists' views on that. Um, and uh, obviously training um, for um, the appropriate uh, staff in your organization that, that, that handle um, these systems uh, for you. So hopefully that gives a flavor. Um, Construction Leadership Council, Build UK uh, since um, the beginning of February in particular have been trying to raise pressure on government um, to resist the implementation of these changes now. Uh, they've wheeled out lots of different construction bosses, not just from subcontractors, but from main contracting organizations as well. Uh, the fact that we're sitting here today, 17 days out, and this hasn't been pushed back, uh, obviously suggests that everybody listening to this webinar should now be absolutely focused and prudently engaged in preparing for these changes, notwithstanding the six months off landing piece. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, I suspect there are some who are still uh, hoping, even at this late stage, that there may be some kind of um, uh, 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 deferral. Um, so hopefully that gives people a, a, a flavor of the wider context in which these um, quite technical changes are being made. I don't think people should underestimate this. And I think, um, you know, the, the, the subcontracting SMEs need to look very, very carefully at their cash flow requirements over the next uh, few months based on full compliance with the new regime and make sure that they have got sufficient cash flow because, you know, it would be terrible if in an existing challenging environment, such as the one we're all trading through at the moment, um, you know, good businesses were put at risk and supply chains uh, were put at risk um, because of the timing of this. I think, that, thank you, David, that's, that's really helpful. I think there's a couple of really good points to draw out on that. And I think in a moment, we'll come back to the, to, to the more macro level issues but your your points around cash flow are, 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 are very really resonate as far as i'm concerned so so the point you made about the the, the contractor let's say who's spending a lot on materials um and let's say is on a i don't know monthly billing cycle with their 
with their clients. So if their if their outputs fall within this new reverse charge system, um, then they won't have any output VAT to charge. But what they will have, as you very rightly say, is input VAT to recover from from HMRC on the things that they buy. Now, that business may very well have been on a a, a quarterly VAT cycle, as most businesses are. Um, but it would be very, very beneficial for them in terms of cash flow to move that quarterly cycle to a monthly cycle because they get the cash back on the VAT that they've incurred on their materials that much quicker. Now, the alternative is also very true, and I think this is the bigger worry, whereby if you are a contractor and you are, you are currently billing plus VAT, but under the reverse charge rules, you're, you're, you will not be billing plus VAT, um, at the moment, if you're lucky enough to have a counterparty that's paying you fairly, um, fairly promptly, which I appreciate doesn't always happen in construction, but but let's let, let's assume that it does. Um, at the moment, you are essentially able to keep that VAT in your bank account or use it to fund the cash flow and the working capital needs of your business until you have to make a payment to HMRC potentially up to three and a half months after you've received the money, if you're on a quarterly VAT cycle. Now, if that if you're running your business on that tighter working capital cycle, and, and, and that's, not, that's not meant to be derogatory to any construction businesses at all, I know the margins are thin, but if that working capital amount is critical to your business, then, then you've got a very real and serious problem. And I, I personally have seen construction businesses that are, busier as busy as you could imagine in terms of new work doing work etc etc i have seen them go under despite that because they just simply are unable to manage the cash flow and get enough money in to pay what they need to pay to keep the business going um and this is not <laughs> stating the blind in the obvious this is not going to help um i don't know if the the rest of the panel have any 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 comments to to make around the the, the points that david made um Guy, Debbie? I would agree with David that, you know, timing wise, it's not great. It's it comes at a time when we've got other things happening that people have to deal with. Um, nobody likes red tape and nobody likes this level of compliance. And the construction industry does seem to be particularly hit um, over recent times. And um, uh, one does have to ask, you know, could we cut them some slack? Um, and certainly there has been a lot of lobbying um, towards that. Uh, and we are now, as I said, 17 days away. Um, we will see whether or not that lobbying is successful or whether this goes ahead on the first. Mm, so I think, yeah. go on, Deb, I was sorry. just going to say that um, in my experience, monthly returns, um, the upside of the cash flow is great, but often it's the admin hassle of having to file 12 returns a year as opposed to four. So that can often be the, um, you know, the disincentive for uh, monthly returns. So it's really a matter of weighing it all up, isn't it? What's the, the, the best for the business? Agreed, agreed. Well, should we, should we move on, perhaps go a little bit more open forum? But before we do that, we've got, uh, I think we've got a final poll question, which we can talk about in a little bit more detail uh, as we've been talking about throughout. And um, what, what does our audience think about whether or not these rules are gonna be delayed? Um, Obviously, nobody needs to reveal their sources, um, but uh, do we think it's going to happen on the 1st of March? It's been delayed a number of times already. Um, what do we think? I've got a view, quite a strong view, <laughs> as you might be surprised to hear, um, for those of you that know me. But uh, it would be interesting to see what, the pan uh, what, uh, what, our, what our audience think on this as well. I think those results are coming through. Um, before I go back to the panel, I'll, I'll, I'll perhaps give you my, my view on this. Um, I, I, I share, share the thoughts uh, 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 of the rest of the panel um, in terms of how, how difficult this is potentially going to be, especially in the context of where we are economically, socially, et cetera, through, 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 the, through the COVID pandemic. I'm gonna plump for the fact that it's almost certainly going to be kicked into the long grass. Um, I, I cannot see the rationale for, for something which is potentially, um, and forget the, forget the admin 
and the and the, the the aggravation of having to put in new systems and such i cannot see something being implemented which potentially has the ability to send smaller type working capital businesses under at this time it seems like it would be a very unusual step to take to tackle a problem which yes is absolutely a problem um you know there's another question as to whether the reverse charge is the right way to tackle the perception of fraud within the construction industry but i really do think and if there is anyone and i don't think there is because i've seen the attendance list if there's anyone in treasury on this webinar or listening um i don't think you would you would lose any friends in fact you would gain a lot if you decided to uh to quietly kick this into the long grass so i'm not necessarily suggesting it needs to be binned entirely but uh, another 12 well let's go 24 month delay um would probably not go amiss and i see that the most of our audience agree with us agree with me as well any views from the panel what's your view um, I, I thought i thought the audience mark was suggesting that they think it is going to go ahead uh, yeah uh, okay. i think you've I, I, I think you've misread it 55 <laughs> was still thinking sorry <laughs> yeah 50 55 percent think it's going to go ahead all, all i would say is you know um mark i i i agree with you in terms of what i would like to happen I think it's closer to 50-50 as to whether that is going to happen now. And I would just encourage everybody on this webinar to, um, you know, frankly, prepare for the worst whilst hoping for the best. And I think the best is yeah. going to be a further deferment. Um, but that's no reason why uh, everybody shouldn't be uh, obviously preparing properly. And hopefully the note that uh, we circulate after this webinar will, will help. One uh, obvious plug that I, I should make as the, uh, the lawyer on the panel is that um, we have prepared um, some standard amendments, as, as you would expect, for um, uh, 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 construction contracts going forward, um, whether you're contracting with an end user uh, as a main contractor and at the subcontractor level. So we have um, standard amendments that we've drafted, which will fit into our wider suite of standard amendments to JCT main contracts and subcontracts. Um, they're not massively extensive, um, but there are some sensible further amendments that uh, uh, it is uh, uh, useful to introduce into uh, the construction contracts going forward, um, clarifying uh, the status of um, uh, 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 whether a party is providing services to an end user or not. Uh, and uh, translating effectively uh, mm -hmm. section 55A specified services and exempted supplies order 2019 uh, obligations into your contract. So if anybody uh, is about to enter into uh, uh, new contracts and this thing doesn't get pulled before the 1st of uh, March, um, Charles Russell Speechy construction team would obviously be delighted to assist you uh, with updating uh, your amendments in that regard. Hmm. Shameless plug over. No, 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 that's that's why we're all all here, David. Let's uh, let's not beat around the bush. <laughs> I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump in as well and say that um, I'm probably more the pessimistic side, which is uh, natural for an auditor. Um, and I'm going to uh, say that I do think it is going to go ahead. Um, I've got several clients who have received letters from HMRC in the last few weeks. Um, telling them about the rules, making sure that they're prepared, which certainly indicates the HMRC are ready for it. Um, and I think that if it is going to have a damage on the cash flow in the industry, then potentially that means that there's a cash flow benefit to the revenue, which right now I think is probably quite a good thing in their mind, given the amount of cash that they've splashed um, for, for COVID. So if, if that's the case, if they see this as an ability to help their cash flow, the government's cash flow, then I can see them wanting to press ahead with this um, and go forward. Um, what I'd like to happen is I'd like it to be kicked into the long grass and preferably yeah. binned all together. But um, unfortunately, in life, we don't get everything we want. That's interesting. I mean, um, don't forget as well, the two days after the date that it's still on course to come in is the budget. So let's think that through. So say they do decide after all the Brexit um, challenges that we've seen, um, in the last six weeks, and a lot of that has gone to HMRC because the number of VAT registration applications has rocketed. Because I know I've been sort of doing supply chain management on that side. Um, so, I may, but they've got to make that decision quick 
it's not fair. And as you know, Guy, you and I have been working, doing before and after modeling with clients on projects as to what it would look like under the normal rules and what it would look like under the new rules so that they can see projects in the reality, if you like, the practical impact of this so that they can see a how they can comply b how to configure their systems and see how to look at the impact on cash flow and, and like anything i think that's looking at real life scenarios is the best way to embrace it yeah, indeed but... and if i can jump in with a shameless plug myself um following uh, following david so obviously that cash flow point is an area where um, mks can help um, um over and above simply the vat compliance side um, it is a major point and it is a major issue. Cash flow for any business is the lifeblood and the ability for it to keep going. Um, and we'd be more than happy to help um, clients and, uh, and others to make sure that they protect themselves against going down the line of some of the experiences Mark has seen of, um, of businesses falling over despite being busy just because of that cash flow falls. Debbie, Debbie, yeah. Debbie Jennings, can I ask you a couple of um, questions that have come in on the chat that are, are, okay. are a, bit, a bit more detailed, but uh, but uh, I think uh, it, it's more on the more on the operation. So so questions come in as as to how does how does this impact a business that's currently uh, probably a smaller business that's currently using the cash accounting scheme for VAT? Um, doesn't matter. You just look at the um, you just look at the tax point rules. So you'd be looking at, uh, so, the, so the scheme is coming in, it's not impacting on what the tax point rules are, i.e. you have a liability, the earlier receipt of cash or the issue of an invoice. If you cash account, obviously it's all driven by the cash. Yeah. Um, so you'd be looking at, but it doesn't change. This is about how you account. This doesn't change the other rules. So um, I saw something coming through with the chat about uh, payments on account for larger taxpayers. Well, yes, if this profile changes your, your VAT accounting, so you come out of payments on account, then apply to HMRC either to come out of the regime or to change the, the amount of payments on account. Um, it's outside the flat rate scheme, but that's a fairly small turnover business anyway. And a, 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 another fairly niche point, but a critical one yeah. nonetheless. What what do people put on their invoices where they would normally add standard rated or, or, okay. or you know, reduce rate VAT? What do they put on their invoices? OK, so you've got a net amount. Uh, so say it's a standard rate supply in relation to commercial buildings. So you just put the net amount and what you would put in the uh, narrative on the invoice. Uh, this is subject to the reverse charge in your books something along the lines so you just draw the attention to the customer that the VAT accounting is their obligation under the reverse charge. Okay. Um, well, I think we're, thank you for that. I think we're, we're largely coming to the end of our, of our session now. Um, sorry, I'm just checking the chat to see if there's any other, anything that I can um, reasonably ask the panel without uh, exercising their brains too much. I think there's a good observation that's come through and, and, you know, I think it's a, it, it, it's a position that we would all echo at this end that 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 the, there are a combination of things and David it, it intimated it earlier there are a combination of things that are coming down the track for the construction industry which could make the next three four five six months an absolute perfect storm of adverse headwinds to coin a phrase that's used by our our political betters more often than not um the end of furlough um starting to repay back bounce back loans pandemics continuing cis changes ir35 um who knows what else will come out in the budget um so i think it, it probably will end there but suffice to say from i think everyone knows what mks do we're clearly very grateful to um to david for joining us from charles russell speechley and i think it's quite clear what how they can assist you um but if there are any further comments or questions or anything that you'd like to discuss specific to your uh, your own circumstances, then please get in touch with one of us. And as I said at the start, or, or maybe I, I forgot and raised it slightly later, we will be sending a follow up to everyone who's kindly attended this uh, webinar um, with some with some with some further details and and some hopefully some insight that you'll find uh, you'll find useful. But uh, I think we'll leave it there. Um, thank you very much for attending and uh, hopefully see you all soon in person. Cheers. Thanks, Mark. Great to be part of it. <laughs>